Okay, so my goal with this presentation, I'll be talking about how we can scale autonomous vehicles using a type of technology known as end-to-end -end learning. My goal with this talk is to spend around 25 to 30 minutes just talking a little bit about the technicals behind end-to-end -end learning, followed by a 10 to 15 minutes at the end just to go over Q&A. So yeah, just to give a little bit of a quick intro about myself, I'm Shri. I'm a 16-year-old that's working in the intersection between artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles. So my research focuses a lot on how we can leverage advances in deep learning to create vision-based systems that are able to deploy at scale. I've also been building in other places as well. I recently built DataGAN, which was this way to generate synthetic data for out-of-distribution events in self-driving so that we can train better self-driving networks. I've also played around with reinforcement learning where I've used deep Q networks to train an agent to drive in highway environments. I spoke at Udacity in Series 6 Sam not too long ago on the research that I'm doing in self-driving. Right now, I'm essentially working on creating policies that are able to autonomously navigate the world using cameras. So this presentation will go a little bit into some of the work that I've been doing from a more broader perspective. So I'll be talking a little bit about what end-to-end -end learning is, how we can create these policies using deep neural networks. I'll talk a little bit about how we can make end-to-end -end systems much more complex than what they seem like by incorporating things like sensor fusion, spatiotemporal information, and intermediate representations. I'll also talk a little bit about how we can localize autonomous vehicles and actually creating trajectories and motion plans. So that's the main download of the presentation today. And then I'll close it off towards the end by just talking about some of the biggest barriers in the end-to-end -end learning space, along with what it really means to solve self-sharing at scale. So let's get started. Let's get this started. Yeah. So I want to just go back to this tweet from last year. It came out from Calm AI, which is one of these really cool end-to-end -end companies that are focusing on using computer vision to solve self-driving. And it, it's fascinating when I first stumbled upon it, the fact that A, computer vision is this really interesting topic that a lot of people are focusing on, but B, there's also this belief that computer vision is the way that we can solve self-driving. And when I kind of look across these two tweets, the most, the common pattern that I find between them is the word that of end-to-end -end learning, the fact that these companies both believe in the same vision, which is we can use this type of technology coupled with computer vision to build self-driving. So I ended up building out my own end-to-end -end models. So essentially what's going on here is that given some sort of raw input image and some really basic reprocessing, we can run it through deep neural networks to go from input straight to steering and longitudinal control. So that, that's the rundown with end-to-end -end learning. Before I get too far into it, I just want to give a couple of slides just going over what deep learning is and what the science behind these architectures are. So deep learning is basically this idea that's modeled behind the human brain. So the way neurons work in the human brain is that we have three main parts to it, which is essentially our dendrite, which basically takes in inputs from other neurons. Then we have a cell body, which basically processes these inputs from the dendrite. So the dendrite takes in electrical impulses, we process these, and then we return these values through an accent, which is basically our output control, which then spits out electrical impulses that feed into other neurons. That's kind of the same idea with deep learning, giving some sort of vector of inputs along with their respective weights, we can essentially take the weighted sum of them, pass them through an activation function, and then return this new output that we can feed into the next neuron. And it's kind of just through these ideas or this chain of neurons that we're able to create neural networks. Given inputs, we can then feed them into other neurons and these layers of neurons where we can learn some sort of inherent mapping structure from our inputs to outputs. The main idea behind computer vision and self-driving is essentially convolutional neural networks, which is an extension of deep, deep neural networks, where instead of using vectors to represent images, we can set input matrices. And what we can do is, as we go across these matrices of images, we can extract features that give us better information for training these models. So kind of at the heart of convolutional neural networks is the operation convolutions itself, where we can scan across images. And as we scan across images, we can develop some sort of inherent understanding of what makes this image an image or what makes like a banana a banana. So through convolutions, we're able to better understand features and what makes certain classes themselves. So in this case, this is just a very basic image of how we can use convolutions to scan across multiple classes. What we can kind of see is as we go through the first pass of convolutional layers, we get really high level 
abstract understandings of these images through lines, but as we go through more and more convolutional layers, we start to understand what makes a face a face or what makes a car a car, which in this case, we can kind of see there are eyes, there are wheels, or even for chairs, there are chair legs. So it's kind of just through this convolutional layers where we can understand deeper and deeper about what makes these images what they are. That's the main idea behind end-to-end -end learning, where essentially what we can do is given some sort of camera input, we can use CNNs and deep convolutional networks to extract information about what's going on in our scene. So for example, we could extract information about lane lines and cars and objects and pedestrians that's just going on around our scene. And using that information, we're able to create some sort of output in this case, which we are lateral and longitudinal control, which will not only allow us to drive, but also help us navigate the real world. So essentially in formal terms, the goal here is to create some sort of policy pi of x where pi can take in matrices of information, where in this case, matrices of information would be our actual camera image and return a vector of control outputs, which would be our steering, our brake, our throttle and whatnot, which gives us the information that we need to drive. So that's, that's the very high level download of end-to-end -end learning. I'm going to spend on um, the next 15 to 20 minutes or so about talking about how we can make end-to-end -end learning much more complex than what it looks like right now. So I'm going to dive into things such as perception complexities, getting a better understanding of real world through things like localization and by leveraging GNSS information, and also talk a little bit about how we can take trajectory outputs and control outputs so that we can actually drive our cars into the real world. So... I'm going to start off with the perception side and then dive into localization trajectories. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about sensor fusion. So sensor fusion is essentially this idea where we can combine multiple camera images together into this network where we're not only able to better understand what's going on around the scene, but we can extract information from a greater field of view. So the way that I like to think about it is that if I had eyes right now, I'm looking straight ahead, but if I also had eyes to my left and to my right, now I'm able to get a better understanding of what's going around in my environment. So likewise, in the case of autonomous vehicles, having more cameras not only gives us better information about what's going on in our scene, but it also gives us better spatial information with respect to understanding how far are these people or how far are these cars. So in this case, our info would be this 40 matrix of dimensions N, H, W, and C, where N is the number of camera images. In this case, it would be three, given followed by its respective height and width and channels of the information. So in this case, what's going on over here is that we're able to run each camera through its own individual perception module. And from there, we're able to concatenate these encoded features into one singular vector that we can use to create these trajectories. So each camera has its own learned set of features where maybe for your left side camera, you might be focusing more towards sidewalk boundaries and lane lines, while your center of camera, you might be focusing towards vehicles and pedestrians and objects, while your right camera might be doing the same thing as the left one. I also want to talk a little bit about end-to-end -end learning just itself as a concept. So end-to-end -end learning itself is like a black box. It's really hard to understand why the model makes this decision. So I want to spend a little time talking about this paper from a folks over at wave.ai that talk about how we can create a fully end-to-end -end model while being able to understand it. So when I really think end-to-end, -end, the general picture is essentially you have an input followed by some sort of black box, followed by some output. That's just the typical way you can view end-to-end -end learning. But the real idea is that we can actually unbox this black box by visualizing intermediate representations of our scene. So we can do things, or in, or in this paper at least, they do three main things. The first thing they do is something known as semantic segmentation which is essentially this idea that we can assign a class for every single pixel in our image so that we can better understand what sections of the image matter to us. So for in this case, we can kind of notice how our cars are highlighted in dark blue, our lane lines are marked in white, and our sky is in a lighter shade of blue. So using that information, for example, we can kind of better understand what information is more valuable to us. So for example, maybe trees and skies aren't really as important to us as the actual cars and the lane lines in our road boundaries. Optical flow is also known as motion flow, but the main idea behind optical flow is that we can take in two consecutive images and measure the change in the pixels of these images. So this not only helps us detect movement in our scene, but it also helps us understand dynamic agents like cars and pedestrians. So the way I'd like to think about it is that if you have, if you're driving on a highway, for example, your sides, like the trees and whatnot, may not be moving that much compared to the car. So what you can essentially do is measure that delta between these two images so that you can better understand what's going on between these two images. 
The third auxiliary decoder that's used in this paper is depth estimation, where we can not only understand how far objects are away from us, but we can also use that information to not only create 3D maps of our environment, but also be able to create trajectories. So let's just dive a little bit into semantic segmentation itself. So the main idea behind semantic segmentation is that given some sort of three-dimensional image I, we want to train some sort of autoencoder A to return the semantic segmentation of the image A of I. So we do, so we do it through an encoder decoder architecture. So what this essentially means is that using convolutional layers, we encode our image and better understand what's going on in this scene. And based off that, once we have some sort of internal hidden understanding, we're then able to upsample it so that we can better determine and figure out what are the actual actors in our scene, whether it's the pedestrians or the traffic lights and whatnot. The way we'd upsample is through something known as transpose convolution. So the way I like to think about it is that you can notice this green square at the top. That's essentially this encoded representation. Now what we're doing is we're upsampling towards this blue matrix. So what's essentially going on is that given every single value in our encoded matrix, what we're doing is we're multiplying it by some sort of kernel and then returning the sum of it. So in formal terms, given some input value M of I at index I of J for matrix M and some sort of kernel matrix K, what we're doing is returning the sum of the product of every I comma J in M. So in this case, what's going on here at, at the example below, we have this input that is two by two, zero, one, two, three, and then our kernels also have the same thing. And what we're essentially doing is we're multiplying every single value in our input with the kernel and then taking the sum of all of that. Optical flow is, I find this to be really interesting, but the way I'd like to think of optical flow is that we can denote every single pixel in our image as a vector. And what we'd essentially be doing is that we'd be taking two consecutive images and the way we'd measure the change in these images is by describing them as vectors. And by taking the magnitudes of those vectors, we're able to understand, okay, how much is my image actually changing by? So what you can kind of see over here is that the space, mo the space motion vector itself is what's going on in our 3D world. And what we're essentially doing is mapping it out to this projection plane motion vector, which is basically a 2D representation of our scene. And using that information, we can translate between two consecutive images to understand what's going on. With respect to all motion flow, we have two types of motion flow. We have something known as sparse flow, which gives us the actual flow vectors of these interesting features. So you can kind of see over here, we have a lot of green lines going through our highways, which basically denote that there are cars moving in our scene. Or we could also do something known as dense optical flow, which gives us flow vectors of our entire frame. And we could encode each of these changes of our vectors in a different class. The main idea behind depth estimation is that we can take in some sort of input scene and again, run it through this encoder decoder structure to actually get our heat map about how far things are to us. So for example, in kind of this GIF that's going on over here, given this input of this video, we can kind of notice that the cars are much more closer to us than buildings in the background. So you can kind of see that the closer an object is to us, the lighter the color that it might be. But depth, depth estimation itself is quite useless if we can't compute the actual depth of the images. So what we could essentially do is actually take in two cameras and use and take the dis disparity between them so that we can compute the actual depth of every single pixel that's going on over here. So in this case, just a quick little image at the bottom left that goes into the focal structure of our camera. So you can kind of notice is that the higher our focal lens is, the more zoomed in our images, which basically means that we're able to get better information. So we can use some basic geometry to actually take in these two cameras and compute what our depth map would actually look like. And using this information, we can expand our depth map to 3D reconstruction as well. So given this depth map and given the distance that each pixel is from the car, we can reconstruct scenes in 3D, which really just blows my mind. It's, it's really fascinating to think about how we can take in just raw 2D video and be able to translate it into this 3D simulation space. So when we couple this with even like semantic segmentation, for example, and other object detection methods, we can create realistic 3D worlds that we're not only able to train our autonomous vehicle in 3D space, but it also allows us to actually plan out trajectories in 3D motion. One really fascinating idea that's been researched, that's still in the process of being researched right now, but what I do find really fascinating is how we can incorporate temporal information into our scene as well. So this paper goes into how we can incorporate temporal information 
for lane detection, but we can apply the same logic to steering and control and semantic segmentation and whatnot. So the main idea behind spatial temporal lane detection in this case is that given some sort of, given your images from your original time step from when you start driving to the current time, time step that you are, so from T of zero to T of N, we can essentially combine all this information together and then pass it through an LSTM cell that not only gives us this temporal information for us to understand how our, how our scene changes with respect to time, but it also gives us the information that we can use to better detect lane lines. So for example, what this might mean is that maybe two consecutive images might have the same lane lines because of the fact that your car is driving straight. So therefore, not only could you make less predictions, but you can also leverage previous information so that you're able to make more robust predictions. So this follows as well this encoder decoder structure where it follows something very similar to UNET. So UNET is this encoder decoder structure that not only allows us to use convolutions and downsample, but we can also upsample as well to get output segmentation maps. So it's very straightforward. You do your encoding. And then once you get to the bottleneck part where you've encoded the image and are at that point in time where you're trying to decode it, you can then implement your convol STM cell there where you can essentially get the spatial temporal understanding of what's going on between your images. So the quick TLDR behind the LSTM cell is that given some sort of original um, input here. So given our input and given our previous hidden state, we can basically run a segment function through it for us to understand which information is relevant to us and which information isn't relevant to us. So the way that I'd like to think about it is, let's say that if I had a matrix, right, the higher parts of the matrix, so the sky and the trees might not be as important to us. So therefore, our outputs from the segment function will be quite low, maybe like 0.1 or 0 0.001, because of the fact that that information isn't as relevant to us compared to the cars and the lanes and whatnot. So essentially what we can do with an LSTM cell is be able to understand which parts of the image matter to us and which parts of the image don't matter to us. And using that information, now we can focus on things that matter. So in this case of lane detection, now we can focus more so towards the actual road and towards the bottom half of the image where the lane lines actually exist. So we can leverage these LSTM cells and couple them with kernels and batch normalizations so that we're able to perform convolutional LSTMs. So one of the problems with LSTMs was the fact that it isn't sufficient enough to deal with matrix data and camera data, but what we can essentially do is perform convolutions and batch normalization as a pre-processing step before we feed it in into our LSTM cells so that it can better understand what's going on within our scene. And then from there, we do a really basic, straightforward transpose convolution and then upsample it back up from our convolutional LSTM cell. One other really cool thing that I like to talk about with respect to perception of end-to-end -end learning is that we can visualize what our CNN looks like. So this is a paper from a group of folks from NVIDIA back in 2017. But what they essentially did was that they asked this question of given convolutional feature maps that we get from our actual convolution and max pooling passes, can we instead work backwards? So instead of doing these convolutions, can we use deconvolutions so that we can go backwards and understand what are the type of features that our network is looking for? So there are kind of four main steps to this. Like you first take intermediate feature maps from the actual convolution operations. And then from there, you, you do averaging for every single channel and then multiply each, each feature map with this previous layer and then use deconvolutions to get this final visualization mask. So it's a really good tool to really think about just because of the fact that it helps us not only understand what our model is thinking, but also helps us understand what our data looks like as well. This not only helps with identifying failure cases in case, for example, a car may inaccurately detect lane lines that might mix them up, especially if it was in like a snow or like a very adverse condition, but it also helps us better understand how these black boxes think and rationalize. So the main idea that I'm trying to essentially get at is that if one of these outputs, so in this case, if it was our semantic segmentation map or optical flow map, or even just our visualization of our CNN channels, that must mean that the policy failed to encode the information from the cameras accurately. The second part that I quickly want to go over is localization. So the way I like to think about localization is through this very basic exercise. So if I gave you this map of the entire world and I gave you this image, do you know where I am? And then the answer in this case would be Paris, France, right? But that's how I'd like to think about localization. So essentially given some sort of camera image and given some sort of really basic GPS reading, can I figure out where in the world am I? 
right? So essentially what we're doing here is using a GPS signal to help us incorporate our prior data. So what this might mean is that, let's say if I was at some certain longitude and latitude, that might give me information such as maybe my autonomous vehicle needs to be really cautious with respect to speed and steering because there might be, there might be a place where there are a lot of accidents. So the main idea here is that when we're given coordinate information, we can essentially find similarities between our image and the real world, which not only allows us to have this image GPS coordinate pairing together, but it also else helped us understand how we can drive from point A to point B. So another interesting thought exercise is essentially what would happen if our GPS suddenly blinked out? So usually most GPSs, when you're driving under tunnels, your GPS suddenly stops working. But what you could do is pair this GPS with something known as a common filter. So the way common filter works is essentially through these two steps. The first being you have a measurement update followed by a prediction. So in this case, you have the state estimate of where you are in the world. And then based off that, you make a prediction. And once you get this new measurement, now you're able to update your prior estimates so that you can figure out where you are in the world. So likewise, with autonomous driving, given some sort of GPS reading, and given your speed and your longitudinal values, now I can start figuring out where I'm going from A to B. So if I wanted to do something like Google Maps, maybe I want to go from my home to like a local Walmart or a grocery store, given this very higher level route understanding of where I am in the world, I can couple this together so that I'm able to understand where I'm going while also understanding with my cameras, the type of situations that I'm in. So this type of learning is known as conditional imitation learning. So using our Google Maps or a higher level satellite navigation maps, we can give a higher level direction. So maybe if I'm at the point where I want to turn left, I would pass it maybe like a one hot encoded vector, which would be like one zero zero, which means that I need to turn left then. This also is still something that's in research right now, but it's, it's quite fascinating to think about, okay, given a couple cameras and given this very unrouted map, can I use that information so that I can do both probabilistic and deterministic control? So that's a little rundown behind localization. Trajectories is very fascinating. There are two ways you could approach about it. The way that it's traditionally approached is essentially by doing direct control output. So this would be your steer, your speed, your brake, and your reverse, right? But the other way you could also do it is by actually planning the trajectory itself. So what this might mean is that the way common AI works is essentially what they do is they're able to encode an image and based off that they return an output matrix of dimensions 33 comma 3 which give you the xyz coordinates of where this car should be at every single time step and essentially what happens is that using that information they can feed these coordinates into a motion controller plan which allows the car to drive so what's really interesting about this approach is the fact that you now you're able to plan ahead with respect to time so now you're not thinking about the output that you should give at time step T, but now you can start thinking like n time steps ahead and using your information about how your world might change n time steps from now, you can start planning ahead so that you're not only able to save computational power, but you're also able to better understand how your world changes with respect to time. Great, so that's the download on end-to-end -end learning and just a little bit of the stuff that I'm researching about right now. I wanna spend the next couple of minutes going over end-to-end -end learning and just the real world and what it really takes to solve end-to-end -end solutions. So for me, I like to view the barriers of end-to-end -end learning in these two buckets. So the first being the interpretability of these networks, while the second is the actual sheer amount of data that it takes to train these models. So just to expand a little bit more upon this, the interpretability of neural networks itself is basically this question of, given this black box of information, how can I create some sort of policy so that I can be able to rationalize upon this? So if my model ever made a mistake or if it made incorrect classifications, can I understand why my model made this misclassification and whatnot? The significance of this is mainly the fact that it helps us not only understand in, in the case of policy as well, from like a governmental perspective, be able to understand why your car is messed up, but it also helps us to walk through failure cases and outer distribution events. So let's say that if my car was trained explicitly on highway environments, and then I walked into an urban environment where there are a lot more pedestrians and whatnot, then we could better understand why our model fails in these situations and then be able to iterate from there. The other bucket is the fact that the data required to train these models is actually very substantial. Most of the data that we have for self-driving is not really diverse in the sense that the majority of data that you collect is very straightforward, highway driving, one lane for several hours. But 
And the problem is that if you want to create self-driving that works at scale, you need to be able to have diverse data that's not only diverse, but also very high quality. So situations that might not exist, or if they did exist, the probability of them would be really low. It's important that we have this diverse set of data so that our model knows how to react in any sort of situation. And this not only ensures that our model is robust, but it's also able to help us guarantee that our model can perform in any sort of situation. So the main idea behind here is that interpretable models are not only important for backlogging and understanding errors, but it also helps us improve our models in finding edge cases. So a single error in the actual prediction of a model is, can mean life or death for our passengers. Self-driving itself is a very high stakes environment where a single mistake can have very big implications. So it's really important to make sure that we have human interpretable understanding of our networks so that we can understand what's going on in these black boxes and then be able to also rationalize and understand why our model made certain decisions. Another thing I quickly like to touch upon is the fact that our data that we have for today's self-driving world is not really good enough. So this is just a quick little snapshot from one of the steering data sets that's given by Udacity. But what you can kind of see is that the majority of our data is centered around a zero degree of value, where almost 50 to 60% of our data is usually in environments where the steering output is zero degrees. So the problem with that is mainly the fact that when it comes to out of distribution events, where very rarely you might have to swerve or hit the brakes or something, we don't have enough high quality data so that our model can't react in these proper situations. The other thing is out of distribution events where the real world always has complexities that we can't incorporate in our data, but it's important to make sure that our model is able to work in every sort of situation that happens in the real world. So I want to spend the next just couple of minutes talking about the fact that self-driving itself is a very hard problem. But the, the truth of the matter is that we can't really solve self-driving, but we can achieve super premium performance. So what this essentially means is that right now, self-driving has come a long way since it did back in 2003, 2004, back in the DARPA Grand Challenge days. But we're still at a point in time where we're not able to generalize and solve self-driving out to the real world. We've come really far and we're able to drive in multiple diverse and challenging situations, but there are always these outer distribution events that we can never account for in data. So it's important that we're able to not only account for this, but we're also able to create one sort of generalizable policy that's not only able to drive in certain cities, but is able to scale up around the world. So as a quick, this, just to quickly end this presentation, I wanna end this with a little quote from Anjit Karpati, former director of AI at Tesla. So humans, drive around with vision. So this is kind of just the main idea behind end-to-end -end learning is that if humans can drive with vision, so, so can computers. So yeah, that's a little bit about end-to-end -end learning. Uh, but yeah, happy to take on any questions. Okay, so let us just see these. So what are examples of more modern architectures? I see the slides from 2019. Have there been challenges from the two-stream 3D scene and approach? Are companies still widely using similar architectures from 2019? So I'm assuming this is about the uh, urban, the wave urban driving paper. Let me just quickly pull up that slide. Um, so my answer to that is essentially yes and no. So the way that I'd like to think about it is that the approach for end-to-end -end learning is very straightforward, right? You're given this image, you're given this neural network that's able to process this image, and then you have this output, which is your lateral and longitudinal control. So that's kind of just the main meat of deep learning, or in this case, end-to-end -end learning. But modern architectures, there is still being a lot of stuff in work. I believe Wave.ai also recently released this new blog. I can just quickly pull it up. But they did release this blog recently that goes into how we can use other complexities into our model, where in this case, what they essentially did was use information like bird's eye view and whatnot so that we're able to create better models. So, yeah, let me just give me one moment. I'll link that blog. It might be something of interest to you. But yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Elon Musk predicted that AVs would be commonplace by 2021. What went wrong? And what's your prediction about AVs? I think, I think it's a very good question, but it's also very hard to understand what really went wrong. So the way that I like to think about this is that self-driving itself is a very complex environment. So even though we're able to create 
driving that works in certain environments of the world, it's very hard to create generalizable driving if you don't have cars that drive all over the place. That's why companies like Tesla perform so well because of the fact that they have so many users that live across different places in America. They're able to collect so much data about what's going on in the real world. What went wrong? I think, I think it's still something that'll fix up with respect to time. So what I mean by here is that Self end to end learning itself is a very complex situation, especially with computer vision. The challenge of using deep neural networks and convolutional nets to go from input to output is something that's essentially a data problem where the more and more diverse data that you have and the more and more high quality data that you have, the better your model would be and the more generalized it would be with respect to the real world. I think my prediction with AVs, I think we've come very far in the past 10 to 15 years. But I do see this taking maybe five to 10 more years to get it nailed down. So we're, we're at the point where we've, we're at 99% of the way of self-driving, or we have 99% of it solved. But for every single 0.9 that we add to that 99.9, the challenge of self-driving becomes tens of thousands of hundreds of times harder than what it is before. Okay, so if that answers that question. Um, have you tried the new idea of VIT vision transformer in your work? So I have not, but it is a very interesting piece of work. Transformers itself and self-driving have had a really big boost over just the past 12 to 18 months, seeing how we can apply this idea that was originally made in NLP into self-driving. But it's really fascinating to think about how we can incorporate better scene understanding through transformers. So the answer to that is no, but it is a very interesting space to think about. All right, so I think that's all our questions. If you have any questions that come to your mind, feel free to queue those up in the Q&A box. Looks like we got one more, one more. and we'll, we'll flip over. Let's take a look for optical flow. If the cameras are on the driving car, wouldn't the background move faster than the other cars that are driving along with the self-driving car? So yes and no. I would, I would say no, mainly because of the fact that what you could essentially tell is that your background most usually is static, meaning that if you, your trees and whatnot, they would be moving, but the change in the pixel values of that movement is much more or less compared to the change in the pixel values of the car. So you could essentially tell based off your environment that there are cars moving, especially if there's on like the opposite lane, then I can see that these cars move much more faster than these trees that are moving. So therefore you can use that information and leverage it so that you can do a better prediction. Um, how do I set up, set up a similar environment? So I can just quickly talk about that. Um, there are a lot of really good simulators online for self-driving. Uh, one of the ones that I know a lot of people use is known as Carla. It is a really good simulator where essentially it just has everything you need for self-driving. It has like LIDAR values, so semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, all these types of stuff. So it's a really good simulator. I've been playing around with it as well for the past couple months. Very fun to play around with. But if this is something you're really interested in, then I would recommend taking a look at this. Um, humans mainly rely on vision for driving, but sound is somehow important. For example, in the case of an ambulance calling, you may not see it, but you need to hear prepare for unexpe unexpected circumstances. How important do you think sound may play a role in how we drive and how can this help computer vision anyway? So this is a great question. This is also something that I've been thinking about as well. So sound is very important, especially in this case, ambulance and police cars and whatnot. So that my, my hypothesis as to how you'd add this to a computer vision model is you would have some sort of separate network that does sound detection. So for example, what it might be is that if you hear a police car, if you hear an ambulance, if you hear a fire truck, then maybe you can do like a one-hot encoding vector where you can be like, okay, if sound equals equals fire truck, then maybe I'll have some command that has the car move to the right and start driving really slowly just to increase caution and whatnot. How do end-to-end -end models with multiple sensor modalities perform better or worse than implementing separate fusion separately from the rest of the decision-making? So there's, there's two ways you could think about this. The first way that you could think about it is in, in sensor fusion, the way that it works end-to-end, -end, right, is that you have it all running through one bigger network. So the way that I like to think about it is that this not only allows you to have a better representation and understanding what's going on in your scene. But the more important factor to think about is that now it's not a human that's determining what type of patterns am I looking for. So the, one of the problems with 
sensor fusion being implemented separately from the rest of, this, of the actual decision making is that humans tend to implement separate modalities into the actual sensor fusion itself, whether it's like SEMSEG or optical flow and whatnot. But what we can essentially do with end-to-end -end learning is have the network create its own internal mapping so that it could pick and could pick up on patterns that we as humans are not able to pick up on, which allows it to not only have a better understanding of its world itself, but there because of that, it's able to have better performance. Okay, we'll go through this. How do, how do the model perform with different lighting conditions? Does the lighting have more effect in identifying the target? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. So lighting and weather plays really, really big into computer vision itself, just as a whole and self-driving especially, right? Driving in night is much more of a complex problem than is driving in day because of the fact that your objects are much more clear in the day versus in the night versus in adverse conditions and whatnot. 